this um, time period is very special in the Jewish faith and tradition. Um, last, um, let's see, the second through the fourth of October was Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year. Um, and we are coming up on the 11th of October, which is Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, uh, the high holy, most holy day uh, in the Jewish calendar year. And so I thought it would be appropriate in terms of finding our own place as Christians within this cycle of, of where we are at religiously to, to look a little bit at that, to look at what... Um, what it is that, um, that Jews uh, celebrate on and recognize and remember on Yom Kippur coming up on the 11th. And so uh, the scripture passage, one that is used primarily, is found in Exodus 32. And in Exodus 32, uh, we're starting with uh, verse, I want to see, verse 21. I'll tell you what, verse 15, I'll, I'll skip back. Verse 15, chapter 32. Hear now these words. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain, carrying the two tablets of the covenant. In his hands, tablets that were written on both sides, written on the front and on the back. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, engraved upon the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp but he said, it is not the sound made by victors or the sound made by losers. It is the sound of revelers that I hear. As soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot. And he threw the tablets from his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made, burned it with fire, ground it to powder, scattered it on the water and made the Israelites drink it. Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, do not let the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people, they are bent on evil. They said to me, make us gods who shall go before us. And as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, whoever has gold, take it off. So they gave it to me. And I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. When Moses saw that the people were running wild, for Aaron had let them run wild to the derision of their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. He said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Put your sword on your side. Each of you go throughout the camp, and each of you kill your brother, your friend, and your neighbor. The sons of Levi did as Moses commanded, and about 3,000 of the people fell on that day. Moses said, Today you have ordained yourselves for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of a son or a brother, and so have brought a blessing on yourselves this day. On the next day, Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin, but now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin." So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will only forgive their sin, but if not, blot me out of the book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now, go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. See, my angel shall go in front of you. Nevertheless, when the day comes for punishment, I will punish them for their sins." This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Sweet Holy Spirit, may you be present in this place and all that are gathered here and all that is said and all that is sung and all that is given over to you in worship and in praise. Lord, when we forget to wait, when we throw stuff into the fire that we shouldn't and when out comes something that we did not and do not desire, Remind us of who you are in the midst of the craziness of this world and this life. And remind us to always draw back to you and to your atoning and saving grace that we find in Jesus Christ our Lord. May my words not be my own, but may they be yours. May my mind not be my own, but may it be yours. Most of all, sweet Holy Spirit, may my heart not be my own, 
but may it be wholly thine, broken and open and honest before these people of God. Amen. So, the word atonement uh, is a way that um, is often used to describe how it is that we are at one with God. And we as Christians understand atonement through the saving blood and grace of Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. We understand that by God allowing Jesus to be crucified and to die and to be resurrected for our sins, that we are thereby enter into, able to enter into that relationship anew with Jesus Christ when we seek forgiveness through him. But for Israelites, this is their atonement. This is their way in which they are reminded on a yearly basis how it is that they are to confess their sins, how it is that they are to be drawn uh, closer uh, to, uh, to God and to his saving grace. And they have as their event, as their understanding of how this took place, Moses being up on the mountaintop and coming down from the mountaintop after hearing this commotion and Joshua summoning them and, and, and calling them to account. As Moses comes down the mountain with those tablets, he smashes them um, and we see that Aaron has instructed them while Moses has been away to take all their gold from their earrings, from their necklaces that they had gotten in Egypt and wherever else, and throw them into the fire, and out comes, it just came out, the way the scripture said, a calf. So I don't know about you, but that's not exactly how I think it probably happened. I think there was a bit more intent involved in it. But I wanna cover three questions that I think are important for us to ask, even as Christians, reflecting on uh, Yom Kippur coming up and on this scripture passage in particular. The first question is, who are you waiting on? See, they were waiting down at the bottom of the mountain and they were waiting on Moses to come down. And as they were waiting, they got bored. And by getting bored, they got themselves into a bit of mischief, uh, a lot of mischief that they should not have gotten themselves into. They did not realize or they forgot that they were called to wait upon the Lord. This whole time in Israel, this whole uh, exile of the Israelites, this whole time out of Egypt in the wilderness, excuse me, is a time where the Israelites are to be focused on and centering on God. And yet who they have been focusing on instead of God is themselves. They have been focusing on their own conveniences or their own inconveniences or their own uh, questions or their own uh, just inability to kind of make things fit in the way that they wanted to make things fit. Do you ever find that your life is like that, that you go along and do the things that you need to do, and then there comes a point where you're like, ah, just forget it. I'm just going to do what I need to do. You forget God. You forget the importance of of being in connection and fellowship and relationship with God, you have broken that connection. And atonement is a chance to reconcile that, to bring that back together, to bring that anew. And so we find, who are you waiting for? Are you waiting for God or are you waiting for someone else to show up? Because I can guarantee you that whoever else shows up is not going to be as powerful or as influential or as important as God. And God's representative is exactly who comes down the mountain after that time uh, up there. And when Moses comes down, he sees that the Israelites have gotten into more than their fair share of trouble. They have been throwing gold and gold and gold into the fire. Which leads to the second question. What are you throwing into the fire? 
Are you throwing stuff into the fire that you are hopeful will change your situation and your circumstance and your outcome? Are you throwing stuff into the fire that ultimately is meaningless, that ultimately is worthless? Are you throwing something into the fire instead that you hope instead of creating an idol would actually be purified? Are you throwing into the fire your extravagance or your sinfulness? It makes a huge difference in what gets end up being put through the fire when you think about what it is that you're throwing into the fire. And I get it. I mean, we have a lot of stuff that we can throw at things and throw into things. But we have to ask ourselves, are we being wasteful or are we desiring to draw closer to God? in this process? Are we seeking to be purified? Are we seeking to be made whole? Are we seeking to be made renewed? Are we seeking to enter anew into our relationship? This is an opportunity for reflection when we find ourselves in those moments of isolation. Rather than going into despair, it is a moment to draw closer to God. When it feels as if God is on that mountaintop and we are down in the valley, it is a chance for us to reflect and renew ourselves. And we can either throw it all away or we can either throw ourselves fully into it. So that's the second question. And then the third question is what's coming out of the fire? What's coming out of the fire for you depends in large part on what you have put into it. What's coming out of the fire for you depends on large part on what you have decided to make into a graven image. And if you have made into a graven image greed, if you have made into a, a graven image your own sense of self and your own self-worth over loving your neighbor more so than yourself, that maybe it's a mirror that comes out of the fire, a mirror that you hold to yourself and realize is not what you desire all along. There's so much more that can come out of the fire than what we put into it if we know what we are called to put into it. The Israelites get led astray because they are bored, because they are restless, because they lose sight of the vision that God is leading them through the wilderness and this time apart, as it were, to be drawn back together when Moses comes down the mountain. And it infuriates Moses. He breaks the tablets. He breaks the Ten Commandments. He reminds the Israelites in that brokenness of the brokenness of this entire situation and yet, it doesn't end there. It ends with the possibility for renewal and atonement. It ends with the possibility for reflection and hope. It ends with a new day, a, a new year, a, a new start. The shofar, that ram's horn, is blown on, on Rosh Hashanah and also on up through uh, Yom Kippur. That reminder of the Israelites to be called to a time of atonement and seeking relationship renewal with God. Are we seeking that same kind of renewal in our own lives? Are we seeing that same chance for a fresh start? See, a lot of times when we think about our sins and the gravity of them, we think of it as the be-all, end-all. And maybe instead we should be thinking about what it is that we're throwing into the fire that could be purified in the way in which we could be made new. Maybe it's the exact opposite of what we have come to fear. Maybe there is something hopeful to come out of that fire after all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Receive now this benediction. May you go forth in the blessed and lovely and holy name of Jesus Christ the one who draws us to God, 
the one in which we find forgiveness through him, and the one in which we find reconciliation and hope and life forevermore. In Jesus' name, 